Good evening. I regret to inform you that the lecture scheduled for this evening has been rained out. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I misread my notes. All right, not the evening for humor, is it, is it going to be then? <laughs> Welcome uh, to the fourth annual Austin Graduate School of Theology First Things Lecture. On behalf of Austin Graduate School of Theology, where I teach New Testament, um, my name's Jeff Peterson, uh, and on behalf of University Avenue Church of Christ, where I'm a member. Usually, our president, uh, our school's president, Stan Reed, would welcome you. He is away this evening uh, and unable to uh, join us, but I know he would want me to uh, welcome you uh, and express our delight that uh, you can join us for this event. Austin, in case you're unfamiliar with either of the institutions uh, sponsoring uh, this event, Austin Graduate School of Theology is a seminary associated with Churches of Christ and in conversation with all who confess Jesus as Lord. Our mission is to promote knowledge, understanding, and practice of the Christian faith by equipping Christians and churches for service in the kingdom of God. First Things is America's most influential journal of religion and public life. And those two uh, institutions share in common a commitment to obedience to Jesus' uh, command taken from the Torah that the first obligation of his followers is to love uh, the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind, uh, and a conviction that giving attention to the discipleship of the mind can strengthen our witness to Christ and enhance the love that we have to offer to our neighbor. And we hope that this evening uh, furthers those goals. In just a moment, uh, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Keith Stanglin, our professor of historical theology, who has taken the lead in organizing uh, these lectures, including tonight's event. Keith will tell us more about our program this evening, uh, and we'll uh, we'll introduce our we'll introduce our speaker. Uh, I've also been asked to uh, be sure that you know that there are restrooms located uh, in the back of the auditorium. Uh, uh, so for uh, for your convenience, let's begin uh, in prayer and dedicate this evening to the glory of God and to his service, if you'll join me. We thank you, Father, for the good gifts of this day and for all that we receive from your hand as our creator. We thank you for the yet more marvelous gifts that you give us through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and through our fellowship uh, with all the saints in your church. We're thankful for the ministry of your church in every place. We're thankful for the ministries represented this evening and ask that you would bless uh, the words of our mouths, especially the words of our speaker, the meditations of our heart, and the witness of our lives. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake, and the people of God's sake. Good evening. I want to join Jeff Peterson in welcoming everyone here tonight to this event. It's good to be a part of this in cooperation with First Things, as he said, for the fourth year in a row now. There's much that recommends this partnership between Austin Graduate School of Theology and First Things. As a faculty, we at Austin Grad sometimes describe ourselves as critically orthodox, which by that we mean thoughtful orthodoxy. We're also part of a Christian movement whose goal was to restore the unity of the church. And as such, we have an affinity for much of what goes on at First Things uh, in print and online. One purpose of an event like this and our mutual collaboration is simply introductory and informative. I mean, there may be those among Austin grads friends who don't know 
about or much about first things. And so maybe they will after tonight. There may be many subscribers and readers of first things who don't know anything about Austin Graduate School of Theology until tonight. There should be more of us who know about the other after now four years of this. But at any rate, I'm sure there may be some here tonight who are not acquainted either with Austin Grad or with First Things. So this is a further step in remedying that. The more obvious purpose of our gathering here tonight, of course, is the privilege to hear from our esteemed speaker, Professor Ephraim Radner. Professor Radner is professor of historical theology at Wycliffe College, which is an evangelical seminary of the Anglican tradition at the University of Toronto. He's the author and editor of several books on ecclesiology, ecumenism, scriptural hermeneutics, pneumatology, and the character of the human creature, and most recently author of A Time to Keep from 2016, Time and the Word, also from 2016, and from last year, the book Church. A former church worker in Burundi and an Anglican priest, he's also served several parishes in the United States. He's been active in the affairs of the global Anglican communion and continues to visit, consult, and teach in various parts of the world, including Asia and Africa. We're very grateful to have Professor Radner with us here tonight, uh, if I can say an ecumenical gathering, as we uh, look forward to hearing his lecture entitled Ecumenism in a Post-Christian Society. Please join me in welcoming Professor Radner. Thank you. Um, it really is a wonderful opportunity that I've been given to share <clears throat> time with you all to speak about the church of which we are all a part, and I am very grateful for this privilege. Thank you uh, to Professor Stanglin and to the Austin Graduate School of Theology and his colleagues for their welcome and a new friendships, which I'm already delighted to be able to be introduced into and to first things for sponsoring this event. I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about today will surprise anybody. Um, let's see. Um, but I do think, whether it's surprising or not, I'm fairly convinced that the issues that I want to talk about are deeply important. Whether you agree with where I'm going to go with some of this or some of my conclusions, I hope you will at least agree that this topic of what our life together as churches, now separated but called to some kind of unity might be in the context of the societies in which we live, that you'd agree that this is a deeply, deeply important imperative to try to sort out. Let me begin, uh, Professor Stanga mentioned that I worked in uh, East Africa for a bit, so let me begin there. As a young priest, um, it was several years that I taught at a Bible college in Burundi in East Africa. And this was in the first half of the 1980s. I was kicked out by the government in 1985, and because of an extended political mess that then turned into a 13-year civil war in Burundi, I was not able to return there for 21 years. But I finally got back to Burundi in 2006. The Civil War was over. An international peace conference, in which at one point Nelson Mandela was involved, had given rise to a kind of unity government, the one firmly in control of the long repressed majority group of the nation. What I saw on my return after 21 years of being away was striking. Now, there had been hundreds of thousands of people who had died in the previous decades' war. The country was visibly poorer than when I had left it 21 years earlier. But on the other hand, there was a palpable sense of energy and joy that pervaded the nation, as if peace at last had actually finally given some new purpose and vision to people. There was now an integrated army, 
and the carefully ordered government of reconciliation. And most striking to me was that religion was everywhere. Not only the flourishing Catholic Church and other established groups like the rapidly growing Anglicans, but new churches in every village, Baptist, Evangelical, Pentecostal. And finally, I sensed a new and astonishing openness in all of this. I attended a Catholic ordination service that year when I went to visit. It was seven hours long in the sun with dancing and music, and there were Protestant representatives galore who had been invited and were present. It was 2006, and the ecumenical fields seemed spread out before us as far as one could see. Now, I've been back to Burundi several times since 2006. Now, what has changed in this past decade? Well, there are still lots of church churches. In fact, there are more than ever. But now people are slipping from one church to another. Young people are grabbing hold of this group or that for a year, for another year, then simply letting go of their church attendance altogether. Politically and economically, things have not gone well for Burundi. The president has consolidated power as a dictator. Political parties have both multiplied and collapsed. There are now uncontrolled violent militias roaming the city's neighborhoods. The army is in disarray. Jobs have disappeared, and youth are unemployed at one of the highest rates in the whole world. Schools proliferate because they offer nothing. In the face of this political unraveling, however, Christian churches have little to say. Or if they do, as among some Catholics, their words are simply ignored. They're not opposed, just ignored, viewed as mostly irrelevant to the real life of the country. So what has happened in Burundi? A mostly Christian country, ecumenically rich in resources, now faces into the hollowness of its Christian institutions, its churches. And however many Christians there may be in Burundi, to be a Christian there is to exercise a faith and life in a setting for which Christianity has little informing traction, except in the form of passing and desperate grasping. Burundi, in other words, is now a thoroughly post-Christian nation. Ironically so, given its status as one of the most Christian countries in the world, at least in terms of population proportions. But Burundi is also a kind of microcosm of Christian life in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. I'm going to come back to it in a bit. My goal this evening is to talk about ecumenism in a post-Christian setting, and I want to then begin by defining my terms which I think is actually something that in itself provides a theory, as well as a vision, maybe. So let me begin. The challenge of post-Christian societies to ecumenical life. A post-Christian society is what? It refers to a civil polity that has no substantive Christian informing base. That is, a civil polity that offers no support for actual Christian life and witness even though once it did so, hence the post part of post-Christian. There are threads of Christianity running through post-Christian societies, but they now are visible only as an unraveling, not as a weaving together. Much of Europe is post-Christian in this sense, as is now actually much of the Americas, South, Central, and North with places like Canada ahead of the others. It's important to understand that there are societies, along with churches in their midst, that have developed along this historical line from non-Christian or pre-Christian to Christian and to post-Christian in this sense, because ecumenism itself is tied to and tracks with this social development. What about ecumenism? I define ecumenism as the deliberate search in prayer, formation, and practical decision-making for the substantive unity of a divided church. 
Now, there are other terms here that demand definition, substitute, unity, division, perhaps even church. I'll leave that aside for now. It's deliberateness here that I want to underline as a key qualification for understanding what ecumenism is. Ecumenism has itself developed along with various societies' own Christian character. That is, ecumenism itself, even in this broad definition, has never been a single thing, but rather something adapted to or responsive to the societies in which churches have lived. And now I want to trace this movement so that we can see more clearly our present moment. And the main point I'm going to make here is that ecumenism, in the form that we know it today, or at least talk about it, is relatively, in fact, very recent. And the expectations we hold for it are bound to a particular time and place that is now fast disappearing as the Christian character of our societies has itself changed. Now let me build off the term post-Christian and now assign the church's social location to three periods relative to the post-Christian. That is to say, the pre-Christian, the Christian, and the late Christian. And I'll go through each of these. My argument, which I will sketch in very crude and broad strokes, is the obvious one that the ecumenical forms we have inherited derive only from the end of this last third period, what we can call the late Christian social ordering. So let me go through each of these, pre-Christian, Christian, late Christian. We can define the early church through the middle of the fourth century as living in a pre-Christian, non-Christian society where the main forms of civic life were shaped by a variety of forces and social assumptions, none of which were Christian, and which permitted and often encouraged a range of religious practices and beliefs other than Christian. During this time, the struggle of the young churches with respect to integrity, or unity, if you will, was waged on the level of truth. And the question was this, which churches taught the Gospels rightly? So unity, in other words, in pre-Christian societies was something given in the recognition of true teaching. And the great battles of Gnosticism, for instance, are paradigmatic of this period of pre-Christian social Christian life. Only after the tidal waves of political and then very quickly social transformations that came after Constantine and then the Roman Empire's adoption of Christianity as an official state religion, that was around 380. Only after that can we talk about the reality of a Christian society. In this context, so after 380 and onwards, the Christian church's integrity now became viewed as something given specifically in terms of structural unity. An ordered network of bishops with geographic hierarchies and conciliar authorities were all meant to, that were meant to include all Christians, and finally citizens, and that were ultimately integrated with the forms of the imperial administration. So for instance, the very notion of dioceses and patriarchates followed these imperial administrative forms. Despite the varied fortunes of empire, administration, and structure over the next 1,200 years, this basic understanding of the church's place in the civil society prevailed until the 16th century in the West. That is to say, habits of unity were built around eliminating alternative, religious alternatives, and their leadership within the church, dubbed heresies, and maintaining a single structural order of ecclesial life. The fact that the larger society was viewed as coextensive with the church meant that such habits of unity were reflective of all the dynamics of social cohesion within the larger society, for better or for worse, and with all the varied elements this involved. The establishment of what has been called a persecuting society, in the phrase of the historian R.I. Moore, may be a pejorative and exaggerated description of the now fully Christian society that this millennium of the church's life expressed, but the phrase does capture some of its express essential dynamics. Now, of course, something happens in the 16th century, already brewing, arguably, for a couple of centuries before, and that is the rise of competing 
Christian societies. The ideal of a Christian society where church, civil polity, and formation are coextensive, however, continues to function within Western Europe not only until the 16th century Reformation division, it informs these divisions as well. And that's something important to understand. Virtually every Reformation and post-Reformation Christian group wants a single Christian society that mir mirrors their particular Christian commitments. That's a Christian society that everybody wants. It's just that now the commitments are multiplying. One can view this period as a kind of reintegration of pre-Christian social understandings of ecclesial integrity with now embedded Christian social hopes. That is to say, once again, we're talking about the 16th century and right afterwards, there is an energetic search for truth, as in the early church. But now within a welter of heretical alternatives, this search for a single truth also presses for social cohesion and integration on competing social fronts. Indeed, structural unity remains a key value in and after the 16th century. This developing reality is that there are now multiple versions of this truthful Christian society on offer. It is the juxtaposition, not of competing churches, but of competing Christian societies that fuels the violence we associate with post-Christian um, life. And of course, violence then fuels anxiety. Protestants and Catholics both work for unity in their own way. But they're now doing so even as in the midst of their societies, smaller groups, spiritual and radical sects, that in the 17th century emerge as their own ecclesial entities, from Quakers to Baptists and so on. These then press in anti-institutional directions that are not so much ecumenical as leveling responding to fears, disgust, exhaustion, and the search for new forms of ecclesial hope. The point here is that early modernity, from the 16th century through much of the 18th century, is still shaped by the ideals and real influences of a Christian society. But early modernity also constitutes a period of fermenting unease in the midst of these multiplying Christian societies. And it is this unease that leads to a new ecumenical outlook. I'll periodize the social character of this unease as late Christian, an era in which a new ecclesial outlook emerges and then flowers in the 19th century. In late Christian context, the pre-Christian social, social search for truth, along with the Christian social search for structural unity, continue to drive ecclesial self-understandings. But now, these two elements are joined by a new element, drawn from the realities of sown disaffection from the 16th century on. This new element is the simple recognition that truth and unity are actually necessary for Christian witness. Thus, their combined grasp requires some kind of deliberate work of gathering and effort and focus. In other words, Christians in late Christian societies, exhausted by the competitive burdens of vying Christian formative demands, come to realize that the churches are not doing their job and that disunity is the problem behind ecclesial incompetence. And while this realization may seem obvious to us, it is historically a new recognition. It's new. Initially, this recognition is a 19th century phenomenon, and it is ordered to conversionary mission, mostly among Protestants, and gives rise to various alliances, congresses, joint projects among Protestants, culminating in the famous 1910 Edinburgh Conference. This missionary focus, however, only shifts into what we know today as ecumenism proper, the work to reunite churches in some formal or visible way as the 20th century wears on. And in fact, it's a mostly post-World War I phenomenon that gets a new sharper impetus after World War II. And I want to stress this historical point. This post-World War period is the sole context of ecumenism as we know it today. 
These wars, world wars, and related realities pressed Christians to see unity and mission as a specifically historical life and death issue aimed at reordering broken humanity. And thus ecumenism as we know it today is really driven by what one might call the motive of survival. Not survival of the church per se, but survival of more broadly human integrity, survival of nations, survival of societies themselves. And so we find already right after World War I, the orthodox patriarchal encyclical call to unity in 1920. And then the same year in 1920, the famous Lambeth Conference appeal for unity. And then we find faith in order getting organized and, and, and pursuing its, its purposes. And finally the World Council of Churches and various dialogues and reunion schemes that flow from it all. They all reflect this worry over the survival of civilization viewed from within the wreckage of two world wars and then a looming potential nuclear devastation. In this late Christian mode, now truth and unity are viewed not simply as matters demanding effort for the sake of mission, but for the sake of survival. The watchwords are repentance, conversion. At the same time, an ecumenism of survival shifted the focus of Christian unity into a realm, the forging of national and international peace and of social stability, into a realm the churches frankly couldn't deliver on. A realm where politics and international relations, pure and simple, held the reins. Ecclesial repentance and conversion faced with the realities of social challenge and the realities of the church's own impotence in their face were stripped of their potential transformative consequences. Now this didn't become obvious perhaps until the 1970s. Christian churches in North America especially, up to this point and perhaps a little beyond, were still buffered by the sense that the civil societies in which they existed were still basically Christian and thus shared their values and even supported their attempts to reform themselves in the wake of their own social incapacities. By the 1970s, however, even this buffer begins evidently to dissolve as the uselessness of the churches to the social projects of a threatened world became obvious. The United States, to be sure, still lets ministers claim housing deductions on their income taxes. But that will soon disappear in the next two or three years, it appears. As will disappear all or most of the assumed Christian prejudices of the state. The banning of visible religious symbolism now set a pace in the province of Quebec and Canada just uh, a week or two ago in personal clothing, including crosses, as a tiny window onto what is happening even if not yet very advanced. The prosecution of Christianly informed employment practices as being guilty of bias or hatred is more self-evidently expressive of a society without assumed Christian orientations or positive support. The withdrawal of conscience clauses for Christian doctors in the face of state-sanctioned and medically mandated assisted suicide, as now in Canada, is the epitome of a society that has left behind its formative Christian order. In Canada on this last matter, as to say state-assisted suicide, churches said little, said it too late, and when they said anything, weren't even listened to. Joined to rapidly deflating membership roles, this social marginalization of the churches just in North America is demonstrably both qualitative and quantitative. Nonetheless, in today's post-Christian societies, the ecumenism of survival from late Christian context is still the only thing that's on offer. We still have dialogues. We have ecumenical meetings. Churches still issue statements, often in common, about important matters touching upon the health of the civil society. But these activities are clearly aimless. They have no social traction, 
and the churches themselves, still disunited, are becoming riddled by the exposure of their social irrelevance, understood on the very terms of the church's own ecumenical values. The ecumenism of survival is now shown to be without the social supports that allow churches to participate in standard ecumenical work in the first place. That is, socially acknowledged institutional identities with civilly respected leaders and popularly influential experts, none of these are things the social society around us recognizes any longer in our churches. The church's values are either unwanted, as for instance with respect to key issues of human life and the human body, or they have become indistinguishable from the values of other far more effective groups, mostly politically or commercially ordered, like the entertainment industries of music, film, and television, or humanitarian groups. Looking at the microcosm of Burundi with which I began this presentation, we can see telescoped into 100 years the movement from Christian to late Christian to post-Christian society and the condition in which this has left the country's churches. And I want to come back to Burundi on the score to hold it up as a mirror to ourselves. With the German colonial seizure of power in the late 19th century, and then a League of Nations Belgian colonial mandate after World War I, Burundi almost overnight became a Christian nation. The government and the churches, mostly Roman Catholic, but also a few designated Protestant groups, ran the country in every respect. Education, economy, political order. The entire country resembled a duchy from medieval Europe. Catholic and Protestant regions viewed truth and unity as central values joined together and deserving of the maintenance that, in fact, the civil colonial powers were quite willing to give everyone went to church, or so it seemed. For in fact, the toleration and indeed civil protection of small Protestant churches by the Belgian administration, much as in areas of later 16th and 17th century Europe, had already shifted matters somewhat from the beginning. The Christian faith had a certain set of question marks raised around it almost from the start, given the fundamental Catholic-Protestant division and the smaller Protestant-Protestant divisions that were uh, embedded into the country from the beginning. More than that, these ecclesial divisions were unconsciously and also consciously caught up in the ethnic, political divisions and rivalries that the colonial administration had, again, consciously and unconsciously furthered and legally established. The Tutsi, Hutu, ethnic demarcation, broadly for those of you who know anything about this part of the, of the, of the world. By the 50s and then 1960s especially, these divisions had congealed into civil conflict and finally outright and often horrendous violence that culminated in the 1972 civil war and the massacres that were a part of it. All the churches, in a way less horrendous perhaps than 1994 in Rwanda, but still pretty frightening, were complicit in this violence. Thus. The search among many for new ecumenical consciousness and imperatives, late Christian, in my scheme, surfaced concretely in Burundi in the late 70s and 80s. This was the period I worked in the country. Catholics and Protestants, Protestants and Protestants, we even had our own council of churches, each were trying to find new understandings and unity to some degree. And why were they doing that? Out of pure fear, on the one hand, and moral concern, genuine on the other, in the wake of 1972 and in the midst of the ongoing and simmering angers uh, uh, and resentments. By the 1980s, however, and just as in the West, the churches had lost their social purchase, even as they were also threatened by potential violence. Truth, unity in individual churches had given way to ecumenical survival. But the late Christian ecumenism of ecumenical survival is an ecumenism that is already too late, almost by definition. In 1993, a new civil war broke out, which as I mentioned a few moments ago, lasted until 2006, 13 years. And it enveloped the country, leaving hundreds of thousands of people dead. 
And the Burundi that emerged, as I mentioned a moment ago, is a fully post-Christian society, despite the huge number of Christians and their booming churches. As Burundi national life <clears throat> evolved, so too has the global context. In the third poorest nation of the world, Burundi, goat herds literally have cell phones. The internet reigns in a strange form within a society that often has no electricity. But also, the doors of religious and especially Christian pluralism were thrown open, and the government withdrew controls on outside mission. There is now a kingdom hall, quite deliberately constructed, in every market village. Independent evangelical and Pentecostal churches abound. American, Asian, and African missionary money has flooded the country with church building, and so on. The results of this Christian competition, set within ongoing patterns of necessary coping with poverty, have created the final elevation of the civil sphere as preeminent, again, just as in the West. What counts is how the political and commercial realm will order life for good or ill. After all, the churches are incapable, it seems, of such order. They are ancillary to this set of concerns of how to feed your family and escape uh, a dead-end society. At recent elections, the only, only the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church publicly spoke against the constitutional change that would give the ruling president basically power for life. And why? Integrity, to be sure, but also the relative material security which permitted the reflection on integrity and its expression by the church itself. Meanwhile, my church, the Anglicans, had little to say, struggling for friendship and resources across all kinds of ideological lines. One could say that this difference marked a divide between the churches, but in fact, nobody was listening to what the churches said anyway. While one can hardly accept the figures offered by the government for those who voted in favor of a new dictator, the fact is that people nonetheless prefer social stability, however constricted, and especially in the wake of 40 years of violence, to political theories and religious claims. For survival and for the effective pursuit of survival, one looks away from the churches now. The time has shifted to a post-Christian context. Now, by analogy, mutatis mutandis, this is what we are seeing in the current political of upheavals in American uh, society and across Europe. It is impossible now to track voting habits according to Christian adherence, let alone actual theological commitment. There are wild swings or desultory correlations. The first thirst for some kind of stable social order sweeps aside all theological niceties in any consistent way. Ecclesial fragmentation in the face of looming existential threat, and hence a weakened coherent social witness by the churches, turns people to the civil sphere as the main formative social resource they feel they can profit from. In places like Europe and increasingly now North America, the pluralized and hence individualized and mobile makeup of both the larger civil and ecclesial context renders Christian life a malleable attitude rather than a communally identified social subject. People come and go. Loyalty to groups, to confessions, uh, institutions, even congregations is profoundly diminished. Motives for decisions and adherence have been personalized and are highly unstable. The result of this, and this is an important point I'm going to build on in my next section, is that the social we that philosophers talk about has dissipated with respect to the churches. Who is the Presbyterian Church any longer? Who speaks for Anglicans? To whom does a Methodist defer? Even Catholics in North America and the West more broadly have gone down this road. Look at Ireland. In brief, churches in a post-Christian context have lost their agency. They are passive and passing networks. 
Now, I've taken a long time to get to this conclusion because I think it is the fundamental one from which to view who we are. The central issue in post-Christian ecumenism is not ecclesiology. That's the thing dialogues talk about. It's agency and the aims of agency. And hence I want to talk now about post-Christian ecumenism itself. Because churches no longer can function as viable or effective ecumenical agents, they have no center, they have no common leaders, no representative stable commitments, while the search for a we has been shifted to the social political sphere with whatever elusive success, to be sure. What used to be only instruments of ecumenical engagement have now become the main issue at stake in ecumenical witness itself. That is to say, gathering and decision making. That's it. That is all that's left. Gathering and decision making. Which has not so much altered the ecumenical purpose, but has isolated it in the starkest of terms. That is to say, to be able to gather and decide something really is, in practical terms, the exhaustive result of the specifically theological realities of Christian repentance, forgiveness, and conversion. I'm going to repeat that. To be able to gather and to decide something for churches really is, in practical terms, the exhaustive result of the specifically theological realities of Christian repentance, forgiveness, and conversion, which is what humanism was always supposed to be about. Another way to put it is this. The church, or the churches, is no longer the means of ecumenical change. But because ecumenism is about churches, that means that ecumenism must be about the church's corporate recreation from the ground up. And that ground will be defined in the simple terms of how people gather, decide, and order their lives together based on repentance, conversion, forgiveness, and what have you. So, in this concluding section of my talk, I now want to turn our attention to this question of agency in the particular area of ecclesial decision-making. For it is here, I believe, that post-Christian ecumenism must rediscover a deeper vocation from God. There are many active models out there of ecclesial decision-making, what in general we can refer to as church adjudicatories. These models almost all arose and developed within pre-Christian or Christian social contexts, mostly the latter. They all reflect the demands and responses made to these contexts, and one can trace their shape according to developing political and social forms over the centuries in this or that place. And these adjudicatory models that the churches have in their various places are all quite different, which is a problem in itself. Furthermore, many churches maintain several models at once in their midst, often in tension with one another. So what am I talking about? Well, you have a Vatican with Pope and Curia. You have conferences of bishops. You have committees. You have elders. You have synods. You have representative councils shaped in different ways. You have numerical voting among complete or incomplete memberships, and much else. These are all adjudicatory forms in place within distinct churches. That is how Traditionally, these churches have sought to make decisions. And they're not just distinct, however. These adjudicatories are separated. None of these adjudicatories, as they order individual churches, overlap by definition. The Vatican shares nothing with the Council of Elders at a small Protestant congregational church, or with the Lamb Lambeth Council of Anglican bishops, or with the General Assembly of this or that Reformed community. This was a challenge in the headiest days of ecumenical fervor. But here's my point. In, in, in a post-Christian era of ecclesial passivity, of the fading of the we, it is no longer even clear how these adjudicatories are to communicate effectively. Who are they? Who do they represent? And of course, this in turn means that there is no real way to decide matters ecumenically. Hence, even when some of these matters are decided upon, say a dialogue group's agreement on ministerial orders, 
And even if their decisions go ahead and are lifted up to be engaged as permitted by respective adjudicatories, they rarely carry anybody along or change actual practice. The knotty question of what humanists call reception in this case is bound in part to the dissolution of common or stable loyalties. At, is, at issue, as I said, is the fact that agency in our churches has been dispersed. Only eyes, however, only corporate eyes or we's can decide anything now. So ecumenism today, if it is to respond faithfully to its context, must be about forming an ecclesial eye that can act as an agent in a world desperately searching for effective agency. And this goes to the root of Christian identity itself. How does a Christian agree with another in such a way that they both do so freely and completely so that it lasts, so that in an older category it is truly covenanted? How do they do that? Christians do so by giving themselves away to the other, which is the ultimate act of agency. So ultimately, in scriptural terms, this covenant to death, epitomized in Jesus' own self, free self-subjection, his delivery into the hands of sinners, is the divine act of agency itself. When St. Paul in Philippians 2 says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, he explains this in the following verses in terms of Jesus' own supreme act of divine agency. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. This act of the divine I, the I am of God, the I will do what I will do, who is God, as Exodus 3 says, this act of the divine I is in fact the ultimate instrument and perhaps even embodiment of unity among Christians, indeed among all creatures of any kind, as Paul goes on to explain. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and so on. Every knee bowed, every tongue confessing one thing before the one God, that's ecumenical fulfillment, right? But just such ecumenical or ecclesial agency, caught up in the great divine agency of Christ, has been fundamentally undercut in a post-Christian context. To give an example, take the fairly radical agreement made between the Episcopal Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America in 1999-2000, entitled Call to Common Mission. This agreement involved ultimately a mutual recognition of ministry between the two churches. It brought in bishops to the ELCA, which didn't have them before. It allowed priests and pastors in each church to work interchangeably and for ministry to be done together at the most basic of levels of church planning and congregational life. It would be wrong to say that no new things were done as a result of this remarkable agreement. But in fact, neither church has actually changed as a result of the agreement in terms precisely of repentance, forgiveness, and conversion. Neither church is better situated to decide crucial matters of faith in the face of cultural challenge and mission. Both churches face their own Burundian analog. And the reason for this, in part, is that the ELCA and the Episcopal Church, though they may work together where they are able, retain a that remain both separated as well as dysfunctional. They do not, for instance, make decisions together over the most intimate of social possessions, that is, their money and their budgets. Where your treasure is, there is your heart, Jesus said. True enough. Altar communion, for instance, as some describe sharing communion, um, is in fact, or ought to be, 
tied up with the communion of goods, much as St. Paul indicates in 1 Corinthians 11. An ecclesial I, or we, can and indeed should give away its resources, its money, its very self. That's what it means to share the Eucharist. But there is no I there anymore. <laughs> That's the problem. One cannot die for another without that I. By definition, without an ecclesial I that gives itself away to another ecclesial I, love grows cold. And this stands as the contradiction of ecumenical hope. With respect to decision making, a true ecumenical achievement would entail that separated Christians give over their adjudicatorial arrangements to others, mutually or not, in a way that would inevitably mean giving up various powers. In the example I just gave, the ELCA would take control over the Episcopal Church's budget, or vice versa. Episcopalians would tithe to Lutherans, if they did tithe, or vice versa. Lutherans would vote on Episcopal Church, uh, Episcopal prayer book revision, and so on. We are not even close to such a possibility. Most people wouldn't want to consider it. It would constitute, in any case, a complete refashioning of a church altogether, any church. And post-Christian ecumenism, the life of truth and unity within a social context that offers no support to the Christian gospel, and cannot therefore discern the agency of an ecclesial eye, will in fact move in just such a direction of refashioning on lo along lines that are lo lo no longer defined by structures that actually arose to navigate, control, and reflect the larger forces of its civil context. I need now to emphasize that what I've just said are not ideas marginal to Christian experience and in a real way even to the Christian tradition in an authoritative sense. The challenge of transformative, conversionary agency bound up with the integrity of an ecclesial eye lies, in fact, it turns out, at the heart of most reform movements prior to the Reformation, mostly those internal to the church, as it turns out, by definition. Reform movements prior to the Reformation were almost always communal in their focus, adopted with specific religious, within specific religious groups or religious orders. In the West, until the 16th century, reform, or the word reformation, and these words were used, came to be embodied in monastic forms, and particularly in the monastic, monastic forms associated with what we know today as the Augustinian rule. In this tradition, renewed righteousness the goal of reform and conversion was self-consciously wrapped up in the matter of how one made decisions. The rule of St. Augustine, as it was passed down, came to influence some of the most vital reform movements of the Middle Ages, the Canons Regular, the Franciscans, and the Dominicans, among others. According to the rule of St. Augustine, the great division among Christians, and in any Christian community, is that not between heretics and the orthodox, but between rich and poor. But the aim of Christian communal life itself is to bridge this division and to create, echoing Philippians in the rule, a life together of, as the rule puts it, one mind and harmony. And as the rule goes on to state, it quotes Acts 4.32. The main purpose, quote, for your having come together is to live harmoniously in your house, intent upon God, with one heart and one soul." Unquote. This, of course, is a gospel issue, not just a pragmatic concern about ordering common life. And it goes to what one does with one's possessions and one's very self. And so the rule then ends this section by saying the following, therefore call nothing your own, but let everything be yours in common. Unquote. Now, there's nothing egalitarian about this vision. The rule makes that clear. The central issue in li li lifting this up is free self-giving and mutual submission. So as the rule puts it, quote, no one should claim anything as his own, whether clothing or anything else. 
because it is your choice to live the apostolic life, unquote. It is your choice. Note how agency is made central to this very common and increasingly common monastic rule, agency. It is your choice. Yet at the same time, this agency is fulfilled in giving all that you have to the other, by which indeed one mind is embodied. There's little specific in Augustine's rule about how to make particular decisions. The rule contains no bylaws for the board of directors. But that is simply because decision making is the outcome to the converted life of self-expenditure in community. That is one mind. Give yourself away to the other, and you are agreed. One sees something of this in St. Benedict's rule as well, which has more specificity about adjudication, as it were. In Benedict's rule, as we know, obedience to the abbot and to the abbot's delegated victors, vicars is a chief and originating standard for decision-making. Nonetheless, the question of counsel in the abbot's decision-making is also a priority. The abbot must take counsel with all the others of the, uh, of, of the order, or prior, with all the others of a community. And as the rule is laid out on the heels of this discussion of counsel, comes a discussion of the good works or virtues of the monks, which are mostly interpersonal in nature, and hence are shown to sustain the mutual counsel and obedience necessary for common life. Humility and charity, in other words, as the rule lays it out, are at the heart of agreement. All of this overlaps very closely with many of the broad outlines of St. Augustine's rule. And why not? The Benedictine version of the essential interplay of obedience, counsel, and communal virtue is deemed deeply apostolic in the scriptural sense, as the rule itself states. All right, that's a little historical sidebar. Returning to the post-Christian church, then, we might be able to see, in light of this sidebar, that the notion of a radical refashioning of common life in terms of a conversionary, communal, adjudicatory form is deeply traditional. What is new in our era is the clear, clear revelation that this is an ecumenical imperative, not just one we carry on with our friends in church. People joined a Benedictine monastery in the Middle Ages in order to save their souls, as the rule itself puts it. The matter at hand today is clearly one of saving the church itself, and in this fashion, for they are perhaps one and the same, of saving souls. In less instrumental terms, we might say that we follow Christ and his grace and to his kingdom by renewing the church in its heart, its root and branches, as the old conciliarist said, body and soul, so that when the Spirit says come, the church as one, as a social I, can say, and say in unison with the Spirit, with all those who hear, can say as well, come. To offer this great response, the church must speak with one voice, as one agent. In another context, I have spoken about the individual Christian in our era as someone who is post-confessional in the eyes, at least, of the world, and internally within many of his or her own churches. The world rarely sees Catholics or Anglicans or Methodists or Pentecostals anymore, nor do our own churches often treat us as such. Today, we are rather naked Christians not just mere Christians, good enough Christians, fundamental Christians, but rather naked in the sense of being stripped down Christians, down to the bare bones of exposure. And this is but a scriptural analogy based on Job and, of course, Jesus. The point is that the naked Christian is the object of an act carried out by God and God's instruments. We can speak rightly of God's rod of the Assyrians deployed against the church in our era in so many places, Burundi being but a small example, and including in the courtrooms, legislatures, malls, and internet of America. The naked Christian reduced, as it were, to simply being the object of a range of cultural and political forgetfulness, complicities, and assaults may seem to be but a passive object 
but precisely in the figure of her Lord, in the one mind that is his and his act, as Philippians 2 puts it, such passivity is transformed into that which is infused with the agency of God. Ecumenical practice in a post-Christian era will and must be joined even more so to and informed even more so by and embody even more so this grace by which the stripping of the Christian is made one with the agency of God so that all churches can say together, thy will be done. And this isn't just abstract theology. It is no surprise that where conversionary ecumenism is happening today, it is constituted by the smaller communities of radical common life that have begun to reform adjudicatory possibilities through self-expenditures of personal and ecclesial possession. And I will give you one example with which to end. I have in mind the Catholic community known as Chemin Neuf, which I've had the privilege earlier this year of getting to know in a personal way over several months. Chemin Neuf, it's French for the new way. The name actually comes from the street where the first community formed, not anything else. Started in France in the mid-1970s. And it's the fruit of a few Catholic priests and others led by a French Jesuit named Laurent Fabre. Fabre and his friends had been touched by the charismatic renewal, in part through the ministry of a bunch of American Episcopalians, of all people. The community now, Shemanuf, that uh, Fabre started, has official status within a now worldwide range of Catholic dioceses and is currently in the process of receiving direct pontifical right through Vatican approbation. It has about 1,500 full and vowed members and thousands of formally committed supporters. From the start, Chemin Neuf was motivated by its charismatic fire, but it was also fundamentally committed to an ecumenical vision that was seen to be rooted in the Holy Spirit's own ordering purpose. The community, which is now spread around the world, though not in the United States, has among its full members non-Catholics, Mennonites, Lutherans, Anglicans, and others, some of them ordained in their own churches. And while the community has celibate men and women members, it also has married couples who are equal status vowed members who live with their families, children included, in various housing arrangements appropriate to their needs and work. They all live together, they pray together, they eat together, and they also carry out one of the most remarkable ministries with young people, single and married, that I know of running retreats and workshops around the world, leading university residences and small groups. Chemin Neuf may be known to a few of you as the group that has officially mentored the St. Anselm community that offers an internship for young people in Christian communal life that is run within Lambeth Palace under the sponsorship of the Archbishop of Canterbury. So that's Chemin Neuf and its sort of history. The center of Chemin Neuf's life is something very traditional in its reforming caste. That is to say, the sharing of money and communal obedience. There's nothing novel here, as I said. Single persons share everything. Married couples and families at least tithe, often more. All members, single and married, take counsel and finally obey the decisions made by their local representative leaders. But one of the oddest things about this very traditional monastic, if you will, orientation that's now been enlarged to different types of statuses of life, one of the oddest things about this orientation, now lived out in a deliberate ecumenical setting and purpose, is that within Chemin Neuf, one can find places where Roman Catholic priests, or members of the community, are finally obedient to non-Roman Catholic clergy who are also members of the community, but who have risen to the uh, levels of council and authority. In more than one case, that has meant a Catholic priest in Shemanuf is obedient to a non-Catholic woman in ministerial orders. And it's all legal with the Roman Catholic Church. Shocking in some ways. Not only legal, though, but also logical, theological. 
It's a theological outcome to a certain kind of willingness to let God refashion the church. One joins Shaman Nuf as part of one's conversion of life, and embodying that conversion in a very traditional way means participation in a new common life with other Christians. Indeed, not just participation, but submission to it in the concrete aspects of money and obedience. And just in this place of conversionary common life, the naked Christian accepts a potentially alien framework. If you are a Protestant member of Shermanuf, that means that you accept the framework of the Roman Catholic Church as a place you will live, even though you are not a member of it. But if you are a Roman Catholic, you accept living in a community where your own life may be directed in an immediate sense by a non-Catholic. In Shemanuf's ecumenical outcome, there is no presupposed common space, the just Christian, mere Christian space, that everybody joins in terms of identity. One makes the choice to join a space already shaped by some specific, in some specific fashion, by another Christian. To repeat, there's no neutral Christian space that is being presupposed here. There cannot be, for such a space has been so long buffeted and thrown about and drawn to this or that group's breast and shaped with care or disdain, such that in this age, the post-Christian age, all we have at our disposal are ecclesially particulars and often exclusionary ecclesial particulars. But if there is no common space to join in a community like Shamanuf, there is nonetheless a common agency to be part of. That is my point. The choice to be joined to and taken up by the agency of Christ Jesus in his spirit, the one who is willing to die and rise. As Augustine wrote in his rule, it is our choice to live the apostolic life. That is where agency is located. That is the post-Christian claim for ecumenical hope, I believe. There's nothing doctrinal about it, I admit, except implicitly and to that degree profoundly. It is personal in a way that refashions organizational and adjudicatory reality. So let me conclude. Should we all join Shamanuf or communities like them? And my answer is, of course. At least if ecumenism is something that still maintains a divine imperative. But a post-Christian society no longer offers the church the scope for strategic thinking. And thus, whatever imperative ecumenism may have today, truth, unity, survival, is probably not susceptible to outlines of clear ends and means. I think that is part of my main uh, point here. There is no longer the context in which a how-to makes sense ecclesially. The post part of post-Christian society indicates something lived through Christian society, but now discarded and left behind. In God's terms, the past of the once Christian society is over and done with. Useful for self-understanding, perhaps, but not for predictive outcomes, and hence not for planning. Nonetheless, it is possible to say by way of contrast what ecumenism cannot mean in our day. Not long ago, I was at a gathering of Anglicans seeking to affirm their fruitful place within a beleaguered North American context. Anglicans at any rate. There were presentations on the beauties and attractions of Anglicanism, on its missionary vitality, on Anglicanism's theological charisms and uniqueness. I don't know about you, but Anglicans seem to specialize in this kind of thing. Uh, on church planted and projects risked and achieved. When it came to church unity, the theme was ecumenism militant founded on new and invigorated realignments where renascent Russian orthodoxy, a refocused Vatican power, and a reasserted Anglican orthodoxy now all joined together promised to reconquer the secular inroads on human faith. The post-Christian context, as I have suggested, is one where we might expect just such fantasies driven by the realities of competition over a diminishing space of social purpose. But fantasies, they are. 
hoping for a profile of social influence that is long stripped away and indeed has been deliberately and happily ground down between the fingers of a religiously unconcerned civil populace. Christian unity, by contrast, will arise within the dust that has drifted from this cultural erosion. The structures of churches, adjudicatories, as it were, will continue to do their work more or less effectively, and they will and must be respected within the scope of their institutional responsibilities. But they no longer have any power to decide for unity. This decision is going to be made by the singular self-giving of small groups of Christians, one to one and one with another. And adjudicatories instead will follow and will change as a result, or they will simply fade away completely, as perhaps they are already doing. Professor Radner, um, if I can have everyone's attention just for a few concluding matters this evening. Uh, we do have a reception with light refreshments that will be through the door here to your left in the chapel. Um, please uh, go there and uh, see some old friends, make some new ones, and look for some of the following things in that room. Uh, we do have a book by Professor Radner, his book on the church, that's available for sale. Uh, we take uh, check and cash only, and I'm sure that he would be willing to stick around and sign a purchased book, and also to discuss... Uh, Even a pilfer. Okay. <laughs> and to discuss uh, some of the uh, things brought up in the talk tonight. I hope you'll also stop by some of the other tables that we have there. We have copies of the latest issue of First Things, so if you don't subscribe to the magazine, if you're not familiar with it, please uh, take one of the gratis copies of that magazine. Uh, we also have a display of good books from Baker Publishing. If you can take uh, catalogs that are available there and there is a display of books, the books from Baker are not for sale but just for looking at and then you have a catalog that you can take. Um, so feel free to browse that. And we also have information about Austin Grad. So if you're not familiar with our school, uh, certainly do invite you to stop by that table. There you will find gratis copies of our faculty publication, Christian Studies, and also uh, some other books for sale that are in the genre of, I would call, catechetical literature, good for um, home studies, for uh, Sunday school classes, for families. Our latest book there is the one on the Lord's Prayer. So take a look at those if you would. So I hope you'll join us for light refreshments. Oh, and also uh, parking. Yes, thank you. Um, if you parked in the garage, you have your ticket. It can be validated. We will have the machine for doing that just in this room on this side of the chapel. I think that's it. I want to uh, certainly thank University <laughs> Avenue Church of Christ um, and their staff for hosting us in this uh, beautiful setting, and also to the staff of Austin Grad who have helped uh, prepare this evening. If we can show our gratitude to all of them now. Thank you. And thanks again to Professor Radner. If we can show him our gratitude. We're dismissed. Go in peace.